Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look now and take some time for him. Don't cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yeah, it's time for him. Oh, an acre of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. To poison all our soil People got no food They got no clothes They got no rent Well, it's time for hemp Thank you for taking Time for Hemp I am your host, Casper Leach You are listening to Time for Hemp On Tumblr, SoundCloud And of course, iHeartRadio We are the only all-cannabis broadcasting network On iHeartRadio, giving you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Great content that you can share with your friends to let the whole world know how important it is to take time for hemp. Don't forget, anytime you hear the word joint on the big broadcast, nearly 2.5 million people all around the world pack their bongs, their pipes, their vaporizers, and of course, twist up a joint and take time for hemp. It is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays we do a big salute to all of our friends at Leap Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And we have our joint host today who's with Leap, and we have a joint guest today who's on with Leap. And they're also going to be talking about the marijuana movement. Not so much about Leap today, but they will be talking about Leap. But our joint guest has been very active in the hemp movement, working with oils and, and, and other organizations. He's got some great websites that he'll be telling you about. And our joint host is very active in the marijuana movement with a lot of groups and activities. And I'll let him tell you about that while I sit back and smoke my joint and enjoy this joint conversation with my joint friends here on the big joint broadcast at Time for Hemp. Your Honor? Casper, Stephen, as always, a pleasure. We have Stephen Bradley, a uh, leap speaker with us today, and, and of course, the man that invented the internet and pot radio. We have Casper <laughs> Leach, the boss. And I, <laughs> me and I Al really Gore, wanted... me and Al Gore, baby. We, we were up late at night trying to figure out how to get these little dots and zeros and ones to work all around the world. So thank you for noticing. <laughs> Nicely done. You cast a good hex, if I can make a computer joke. <laughs> I, I was going to make a an electronic joke and, and somehow work potentiometer, which, as we older guys know, is the full word for what electronics people called pot. Ooh, which is a, it's a scary word. Yeah, potentiometer, a variable resistor, a volume control. So what all that comes down to... We need to turn up the pot. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) And we'll be smoking as always. (coughs) Rock on. (laughs) You guys guys will be smoking. I'm not in a legal state, so I'll be sitting here listening to you smoke. Oh, well, we'll send you a video so you can see how it's done, too, in case you don't. Yeah, why, why, don't, why don't you do that, Casper? Because, you know, we've got we to use bombs. you got to use uh, rolling papers. There's a, you got, there's, a, there's a vaporizer. There's a variety of ways. Is that how ways. it works? Is that how it works? Yeah, well, there's a lot of ways to consume this. So we'll make a video so you can see how it's done. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Thank you. And, of course, always... I have to, just personal, just me, I have to wait until we're done with the show before I can enjoy my legal marijuana from the free state of Colorado. Otherwise, I just find it a little harder to keep track of so many things at once. So I guess I better change my my strain. Well, I'm lucky. When, when my medication comes due, in Indiana, when you used to go, when I used to go get a bag of marijuana, I used to get a sandwich bag. You know, you you put a little sandwich in. Yeah. Well, my caregiver Paul Stanford, when I go get a bag of marijuana, he gets a hefty bag, and he fills it up with five small trash bags of five different strands, and hands me a half a pound of pot, and says, yeah. "Just whenever you run out, you hurry right on back and get more." 
the way life you were, should buy, be. you were buying weed back in the days. You were buying it by the lid, right, Casper? I was, and it was like, well, back <laughs> in the 70s, it was like $25 an ounce. I do recall 25 to 35 an ounce that when was I was in stuff. high school. Yeah. I do recall, and I think this is some of my best memories. Never happened. I think this, I think this one did, and that was basically a shot glass for five dollars, and that's what a nickel was. It was a shot glass. Well, I tell you, I went into shock when I went to get some herb from my dealer in the late seventies, early eighties, and he said it was thirty-five and eighth. And I went, no, 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 you mean 35 for an ounce. He said, no, no, 35 for an eighth. And I said, I ain't paying that. So I went to my next dealer, and he said it was 35 and eighth. And I said, screw you, I ain't paying that. I went to my next dealer, and she said it's 45 and eighth. So I, call, <laughs> I called my first dealer. <laughs> my, my brother is a ski goggle sunglass distributor inventor kind of a guy and that brings him out to Colorado of course where he's a canna tourist a legal cannabis tourist and he was up in Aspen and he went into one of their local retail pot stores I just love saying that and he said what's you know what's the pottiest you've got I have potty mouth what's the pottiest you've got and she said well we we just got in this this new stuff and it's Eighty-five dollars a gram. Oh my God, my heart, my heart. Oh, oh, Elizabeth, I'm coming, I'm coming, Elizabeth. <laughs> now, in all fairness, I took a couple of hits of it. Yowza! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you owed him forty bucks for those two hits. <laughs> I mean, it was seriously, seriously. I guess now we know what the rich folks who are living in Aspen get to smoke if they choose to. Exactly. Well, I know we didn't call to talk about the things that people in the audience can't experience, but there's a lot of things that the two of you are involved in that they'd like to hear. Let's move the topics right along. Let's make a quick transition as a side note. One of the things that's come up in discussions is what impact will legalization have on pricing up? down. What will it do? What will capitalism do? And just as a quick observation, what was running with people doing me a favor, 300 an ounce, I now go to the store medically and it's 200 and change an ounce, small change. So what I'm seeing so far is, a, in, is an increase in quality, decrease in price, which is exciting to see. Stephen, Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. And Leap.cc. Let me use you as, as a setup here. Would you tell us what Leap.cc is? So uh, Leap is a, an international educational organization that's made up of uh, a bunch of current and former law enforcement officers, um, prosecutors, judges, as well as people that uh, are not uh, in law enforcement but believe in our message, which is that uh, the, the drug war that we've been fighting for the last 44 years is a complete and utter failure. And, in fact, we have LEAP supporters. So every one of our listeners, their mothers and their cousins and their aunts, can go to leap.cc, L-E-A-P dot C-C, and sign up as supporters without being a former judge, without being a former Leo law enforcement officer. And it is the speakers, me, Stephen, and a long list of, frankly, the people that used to be the most important pot law enforcement officers in the country. We're talking about, for example, the guy that was the head of the New Jersey State Police undercover narcotics team for 14 years. After 14 years, as I'm sure is true of many of our speakers, he came to the conclusion that you came to. And again, I'm going to set you up here again. What conclusion did you come to 
with your years of various aspects of being in law enforcement as far as what was being accomplished with this war on drugs, war on people? Well, nothing was being accomplished. That was the problem. Um, uh, for the, I'd say for the most part. Um, I, you know, I did see a, a few small, what I guess I could call victories, uh, in, uh, in a few people that, that I interacted with. Maybe I put them in jail uh, for meth, and uh, uh, they made it through drug court. They have a family now. They're not on meth. Um, but, you know, e- even that, there are better ways that that obviously could have been equal uh, without involving law enforcement or or jail or anything like that for the court system. But uh, it was just that, that it didn't work. Uh, it was a waste of money. It was a waste of time. It was a waste of lives, on, uh, of law enforcement lives, of, of uh, American lives, of uh, people in Mexico, uh, the thousands and thousands of people who have been murdered and disappeared there. It's, it's a waste. Leap. We have many organizations out there, and I suspect, I don't like speaking for other people when I'm not lawyering, and and that's my job to speak for other people. There are organizations that have supported marijuana legalization, hemp fiber legalization in different forms, different models for years now. And as you and I know, LEAP takes the extra step. Do you... Is it your understanding that LEAP is claiming that meth, that heroin, that cocaine are not dangerous? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, far from it. Um, Leap, LEAP's position is simply that what we've been doing to try to keep people from using these harmful substances uh, has not been working. So uh, we feel it would be better to instead of paying for uh, enforcement to pay for treatment and education. So we're not trying to convince people that these things are safe, that they should run to Walmart and get their heroin on sale, right? I, I can't imagine a single individual that uh, would start taking heroin tomorrow just because it became legal. I, I can't think of anyone that, that would do that. So if I told you I, I just saw a TV commercial that said, Walmart, next hour, next hour only, heroin, instead of $100 for whatever quantity, on sale, $10. Would the three of us drop the phones, drop the Skype connection, put on our shoes, and run to Walmart? I uh, know because we probably already had our pill prescription that had that exact same uh, substance in it. Um, the only difference is the person on the street uh, injects it into themselves and the person that uh, gets their prescription from the doctor swallows the pill. It's the same stuff. And am I using hyperbole? Am I overstating that right now heroin purchased on the street carries with it a random death penalty? Uh, oh sure, absolutely. You know, you can use, you can be the most experienced heroin user. Uh, you can be using it for 15 years and never had a problem. And get a uh, get a batch that's just super potent or adulterated with something. Uh, go on the night, go to sleep, and never wake up. When you go to the pharmacy and your doctor gives you a prescription and it says, you just had a tooth pulled, so I'm going to give you 16 Percocets, and and they're 5 milligrams each of the opiate ingredient, and it's made by Merck, Pfizer, or one of the others. How is our level of confidence that when they tell us at the pharmacy it's 5 milligrams, that it's pretty close? Uh, Well, yeah, it is, but, you know, there's, there, there's a big problem there in that, you know, the people that are writing those pre- prescriptions, while they haven't uh, probably uh, intended to, to create a, the huge heroin epidemic that we're seeing now, um, they are at least somewhat complicit um, because this is why so many people are now are now starting to turn to heroin because the pills that they are prescribed are now out of their reach or too expensive. And why is it that they're turning to heroin? Why would someone do that? Well, I mean, you could pay $30 for a pill on the black market, or you could pay 5 or $10 for a, uh, you know, a, a, a shot of heroin or, or two doses of heroin, possibly. Um, it's, you know, it's economics. Are you aware, and that was a trick way of Lenny stating a point disguised as a question, 
are you <laughs> aware that a fairly standard dose of OxyContin, time release, and in ways safer, harder to abuse, are you aware that setting aside insurance, a patient is looking at five, six, seven hundred dollars a month for a painkiller? Uh, no, I, I don't know what it costs. I, I don't use them. I mean, I've, I've not used very many painkillers in my life. Uh, but I, I don't know what they cost these days. I haven't uh, arrested anybody for it in several years either. And it's fair to say that of the LEAP supporters, the LEAP speakers, there's no requirement or expectation that any of us use any type of licit or illicit drug, is there? Have you ever gotten that oh, vibe? No. Oh, no, not at all. I know uh, I know plenty of LEAP speakers that uh, – I know, I know uh, active duty law enforcement uh, people that are LEAP speakers. Um, there, there's absolutely nothing like that now. Uh, it, it, this is, this to me, and, and from everybody else I've seen in this organization, this is, this is a civil rights issue more than it is anything else. This isn't a smokers club or anybody that wants to legalize uh, anything to uh, <laughs> further degrade society. We want to quit ruining life. Which the war on drugs? Let's talk about the war on drugs. 1937. Casper knows I'm fond of reminding people of this, tragically fond of reminding people of this, a guy named Anslinger managed to pass a United States law, the Narcotics Act, 1937. And then we get into the 70s with the late President Nixon, and he's the one that invented this term, war on drugs. How is that different than a war on couches or a war on television sets? Now, if you drop a TV set on my head, it's a health problem. If I am using heroin off the street, it's a health problem. Are we seeing benefits from declaring war on dropping TVs on people's heads uh, about as much as we've seen from declaring war on terrorism, in my humble opinion. Um, I, when you declare war on something, you can't. <laughs> somebody that's not really there that you can't see. Uh, all we're doing when, when we chop down, when we chop down one head, four more grow in its place. I mean, that, that's all law enforcement has. That's the best law enforcement has been able to do in all of these years. Um, so, what, I, I, please go ahead. Well, I mean, so. You know, the DEA has a presence in, in every Central and South American uh, narco-trafficking country. Um, it, it, I don't know. Are things better there or are they worse since the DEA came to tell? Well, we know the answer to that. We know Mexico is suffering horribly because specifically of this war on each other, on people. We know that people from Central and South America to evade, to avoid getting their heads chopped off with machetes are heading north into the United States. And then we're up here buying the pot, buying the heroin illegally, unregulated, and then we complain about the influx of people without the right paperwork. I'm sorry. Especially, just... when they're under, especially when they're under 18. Let me ask you, of all the people you've ever met, of all the people you've ever arrested, and you were involved in drug crime enforcement, correct? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent. I was a, uh, a member of a uh, – uh, we were a uniform team that went out and uh, found low-level drug offenders and dealers and tried to, uh, you know, slip them into informants for detectives that handled drugs. Of all those people you interacted with, whether they were giving it away, selling it, transferring it from one person to another, did you ever encounter a single supplier who asked for proof of age from the purchaser? Uh, no. <laughs> nope, not at all. Not one. And you're aware that in Colorado, to buy your legal tourist pot, you must show proof of age. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, even yeah, you have to have a government issued ID. And well, in fact, in Colorado, if you have a photo ID, whether it's your driver's license, your passport, there's no magic to it. You don't need a medical card. Recreation is legal, but you do have to prove you're over 21. Mm-hmm. Correct. And that's what we at LEAP, and interrupt me anytime you want, but that's what we at LEAP refer to as regulation. And of course, we know there are many ways to regulate. That's something that we will learn as we go. And the fundamental shift, when we look at methamphetamine, when we look at cocaine, are we looking at a health issue, mental health issue, or a criminal issue? I think we're looking at a, a, a both a health issue and an an issue in society. I think I think we see um, uh, you know a, a breakdown in society when when we've got uh, the the people that 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 do use drugs. They've been you know relegated to the lowest to the lowest rung of society. And I, I think I think the whole nation has an education problem. And I, I think the you know, the cannabis movement, I think it's doing a lot to change that and to open hearts and minds. Um, my 75 year old mother, uh, you know, uh, fundamentalist Christian upbringing mother, uh, we talk about pot now. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, you know, I think things are changing. I think it's just a matter of educating people and, 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 and you know, changing people's minds about, uh, people that do use substances that, you know, uh, and, and compare them to substances that people do use legally, like alcohol and, and other legal intoxicants like that. Well, hey. one thing I can never change my mind on is paying the bills. Because every time I think, you know, I don't want to pay the light bill. Well, it just doesn't seem to work out the way I'm. I got it projected, so I am forced by other uh, other entities to make certain decisions, like taking a commercial break now. At time for hemp. You are listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastro intestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. Just 
K-E-R, Bud S. Moker, a groovy group of people who know how to put out a great jam. You are listening to Time for Hemp all around the world on Tumblr, SoundCloud, YouTube, and of course, iHeartRadio would encourage you to go to the timeforhemp.com website. Find out how to get a free vaporizer courtesy of KDK Distributors. want to say thank you to them for giving us a grant to keep us loud, proud, oh. and strong. And uh, we've got a new zine coming out here pretty soon, so I'm making a point to go to the website and check that out. And speaking of the website, my website has metamorphosed into a whole new being, courtesy of our joint host today. Uh, when when I, he offered to help, I said, well, it's just a little website. It's just a few little little uh, navigational buttons there. It can't, it can't take too long. It can't be too big wow. of a project. And uh, eight weeks <laughs> later, he finally came out from underneath the pile of a rubble and said, look at this, and it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about our special guest, Stephen, Stephen Bradley, as if he doesn't have enough to do already. When I look at Colorado and I see... So many people, so many professionals, lawyers, accountants, real estate lawyers, living in a state, free state of Colorado, where any one of us over 21 can walk into the store and buy pot, hashish, all the different varieties of the marijuana plant and its products legally. I see that. And I see all these professionals who, in spite of the fact that selfishly, we've solved Colorado's problem and we're ironing out the rough spots. And trust me, there are some. We're still out there fighting for everyone else. And it is heartwarming. People doing something because it's the right thing to do. It's just heartwarming. And I myself... And, and I think on the one hand, I make part of my living defending people on drug cases. At the same time, I'm spending silly amounts of hours, and that's a poor choice of words, scary amount of hours, working to legalize it in other places. That is human behavior at its best. That is our smartest, trying to help less fortunate people. It's heartwarming that that is the kind of reaction we are seeing. Let me ask you this, Stephen. In Leap, we talk about, and Casper's heard me repeat this, and I apologize, Casper, but you'll hear it again, that we can cure an addiction. We cannot cure a conviction. Stephen, what do we mean? What are we talking about? Why do we say that? Uh, well, it simply means uh, so once, once you're arrested, that follows you for the rest of your life. You know, as they used to say on the, the Wheel of Fortune uh, back when, uh, when, you, when you won, you got to buy stuff. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. And that's what you get with, uh, uh, with a criminal record over uh, something as minor as uh, a joint. It follows you for the rest of your life uh, to, to your jobs, uh, to, uh, to, for your professional life, for your professional career. Have you run into, have you met anyone, 
one person, a hundred people, have you met anyone who has overcome an addiction, who had an addiction problem with an addictive, we would say dangerous drug, who has gone on, moved beyond it, and gotten their life back again? Uh, sure, sure. I sure, certainly have. I've met lots of people that have done that. It's not unusual. It's not crazy rare, is it? Uh, for people that change your life, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, uh, I, I, I know people that uh, that uh, have smoked cannabis regularly, and they say, you know what, this is, uh, uh, you know, for me, this is uh, slowing down my life or whatever, and, and they walk away from it. I know a lot of people who do that. And, in fact, I imagine with all of us staying on top of the issue the best we can, we have all read of cannabis, marijuana, being used as a tool to help people break away from dangerous, more dangerous, dangerous drugs like meth, like heroin, like alcohol. Oh, or like, like cigarettes. That's my favorite one when people quit smoking cigarettes with, uh, with cannabis. That's my you absolute mean- favorite. You mentioned vaporizing before, and let's remind our listeners the significance, the importance of that. Smoking a joint is combustion. You light it, it burns, and when it's done, you have ashes. What is not as common as knowledge is that combustion, just combustion, not necessarily of pot, When you burn something, you generate, give or take, a hundred extra chemicals, carbon monoxide, known carcinogens. And as we know, and I'm using this as an excuse to push the education along, as we know, although combusting pot has, in some cases, smaller quantities of the known carcinogens, it's not a tenth, it's not a hundredth, it's a third less. It, it's less, but when well, we, we do, talk... Well, we, we do know that there have been long-term studies done on people that have smoked cannabis in excess of 30 years and do not have decreased lung function or anything like that. Now, that's not to say that these other components that you're taking in can't lead to other conditions in your body. Uh, but as far as lung function, uh, we do know that uh, just smoking cannabis, just that, uh, uh, does not cause significant lung lung damage. And in fact, much to my amazement, I have read more than one study that shows positive impact from smoking marijuana for people with asthma. Uh, Right. I believe it is a uh, bronchial, uh, uh, whatever, you have to expand the bronchioles, um, and I believe it does that. And if that's uh, not, I'm certainly, counter- not, I'm certainly not a doctor, but that's what that's right. Well, I'm not a doctor, but I can read. And when you go to PubMed.com, when you go to Google Scholar, you can do searches. I love it when people say, well, we really don't know very much about it. And we have this tremendous need for more study. And, and maybe it's bad and maybe it's good, but we have to study. If you go to PubMed and you do a search on marijuana, you get just shy of 20,000 studies. Well, that, those want, are the ones that, are, that were written down. I mean, human civilization has been using cannabis for thousands of years. You know, they, they, found, uh, they found dried cannabis flowers in an urn in an uh, Egyptian burial tomb that would have, would have been high THC flour. Um, it, it's been used as medicine for thousands of years. Well, we're we looking. Did, we at, just recently started writing it down. We're looking roughly at five thousand years medical use documented in what was the then equivalent of the PDR, the physician's desk reference, the reference to medicines, both in India and in China. We look back about. 5,000 years. Aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, killed about 900 people in the United States last year. We know, as do our listeners, that in 5,000 years, 
Marijuana has killed no one. Zero, nada, nobody. Think alcohol's killed anyone? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know it has. I, 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 <laughs> when I was in law enforcement, it was uh, every night I dealt with people, uh, people abusing alcohol. And the victim is not just the drinker. It's the people sharing the road with them. It's the people riding in the train car with a person in a critical position who is drunk. And we've all read stories of drunk pilots. And oh, yeah. I don't know I don't know about you, but give me a stone pilot if I have to pick one of the two. <laughs> they just they're just gonna circle around and try it again. Well, and some and, pilots make great music, don't they? <laughs> and, and some pilots make great music. And so the Stone Temple pilots would be a great, great choice of Bud tunes to enjoy. But we got to enjoy a commercial break with our Bud right here on Time for Hemp. THCF Medical Clinics are the premier physician's clinic in the United States. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastro intestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. Sirius Seeds is your source for quality cannabis and sativa seeds. Sirius Seeds are the creators of legendary strains like AK-47, Bubblegum, Chronic, Cali Mist, and White Russian. The AK-47 is probably the most avoided strain on the planet. The high THC content of AK-47 makes it the perfect medical strain for patients seeking quick pain relief. Cali Mist is an almost pure sativa. Female medical cannabis patients have reported that this strain helps relieve menstrual cramps. Sirius Seeds just acquired another Dutch high-quality seed bank, Magus Genetics. From now on, Sirius Seeds can offer you even more award-winning strains. The fine folks at Sirius Seeds strive to breed the best cannabis genetics that they can find, so patients can rely on the effectiveness of their medicine. Go to SiriusSeeds.com to grow your medicine. That site again is SiriusSeeds.com. Well, I went and had a bowl, good green reefer, big fat don't be much, but a weed or a pine don't hide it. Well, I don't hide it. Well, I don't hide it. Well, I don't hide it. Fire up right now. Yeah, baby, fire up right now. Be loud, be proud. Come out of the closet and let the whole world know how important it is to take Time for hemp. If you're just sitting there trying to figure out if Niles and Frazier are going to have a date for Christmas Eve or if all your buddies on the Friends sitcom are going to be having a great Thanksgiving dinner party on the next episode, well, could you be any more of the problem? No. (laughs) Put one foot in front of the other. Get outside that door and become part of the solution. Let the world know we need to end prohibition and take time for hemp i want to let you get back to the joint conversation with our joint host and our joint guest here in the big joint broadcast i hope you and your joint friends at home are enjoying a nice joint among yourselves here at time for hemp your honor we were chatting a little bit about flying high and to complete the point i think flying high is really quite a fine idea Where people go wrong is which end of the plane they need to be in if they want to fly high. They shouldn't be in the driver's seat. (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) But if they're further back, it probably makes up for about a two-inch seat room expansion just there alone. 
not saying ask, I've done this, but I've heard that some people like to take edibles on airplanes. Well, I wouldn't rec. On the one hand, is that more difficult to spot? Is it harder to get busted? Sure. For clarity, for our tourists, for our residents, what is legal in Colorado is absolutely illegal to fly out of the state. Absolutely it is. So my legal advice would be eat your edibles before you enter TSA and then That's go through That's actually what TSA. I was referring to was eating them before and then flying uh, after having medicated. What a fine idea. And keep in mind that because of the um, elongated timeline, the elongated uh, time and effect, keep in mind how long you'll be in the air. Are you going to rent a car when you land? With edibles, you do need to plan more in advance because of the timing. In your years on law enforcement, I know this is another softball, but it makes the point. Have you seen people consume alcohol and end up substantially impaired in their ability to drive? Daily. Uh, multiple, multiple times a day. Absolutely. And what would your thoughts be if you went to the state to renew your driver's license and they said to you, oh, by the way, do you ever drink alcohol? And you said, yes, I, I do. Do you ever drive drunk? Absolutely not. But, yes, you consume alcohol. So we're not going to give you a driver's license. Is there anything like that for real happening, or am I just making this up? I uh, know. So there are uh, two bills in Tennessee right now uh, that were introduced yesterday, one in the House and one in the Senate. Uh, they are medical marijuana bills that have very tight restrictions. Uh, and one of those restrictions is any program participant must surrender their driver's license to the state for the duration of their participation in the medical marijuana program. Now, so we know... I, I, I would compare that instead to asking anyone if they take uh, medication, not alcohol. Alcohol is a, it doesn't have many medical values. You so, know, for I, example, I would, I would compare that to, to asking someone to surrender their license if they take, uh, you know, if they have a prescription for uh, for uh, uh, Percocet. Okay, so you have to surrender your driver's license. It seems to me like it would be about the same thing. I like Valium as an example of that because I think people are generally aware that if you take some Valium, you can end up falling asleep behind the wheel. You can end up indisputably impaired. Does that mean we take everyone's driver's license if they have a Valium prescription? What about their ability to fill out the federal form if they happen to want to exercise their Second Amendment right to have unimpeded ownership of a firearm with few exceptions? Yeah, that's. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've never seen restrictions like this in in any sort of legislation that same people have ever passed. Um, and, and to see that it uh, is coming out of the, both the House and the Senate, and it's going to pass both of those and go to the governor, then uh, that that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. Ironically, a person goes in Tennessee. Let's assume the worst. This garbage passes. So they go into Tennessee. They want to get their driver's license. They're now faced with a choice. Either lie or don't drive. Why would we do that to our own people? Why well, would we? Would, well, patients would be registered with the state. So you're right. The, it would be a choice between lying and, and uh buying uh, uh, on, on the illicit market as they do now or signing up legally for. Um, and I, I want to point out, too, uh, they're only going to have six providers across the state. Tennessee is a very large state, um, and they're only going to have six providers uh, who, who are willing to throw away $50,000 just for an application fee. So um, <laughs> I would say even after this law passes, it's going to be hard to find 
reasonably top price medicine in, in Tennessee. When I hear about limitations like that, one thing that crosses my mind is availability. Do you have to drive 500 miles, 100 miles? Just plain old American capitalism, supply and demand. There's another piece of it that crosses my mind. How many different strains can one grow operation produce? Three, five, ten, not a hundred. In the state of Colorado, I would not be surprised if we can choose from a hundred strains. I was speaking in New Jersey, home of Thomas Edison, and I can picture the conversation now. Tom Edison goes to the mayor of Newark, and I believe he worked Hoboken also. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got this little problem here. I've invented uh, electricity. I invented the Internet, and now I'm working on a light bulb because that would be a really handy thing to have instead of, say, an open gas flame. But what you're telling me by saying you can grow no more than 10 strains, and New Jersey started with three, what you're telling me is I can only try 10 things for filaments, and if those things happen to not work for my medical condition, for my light bulb, then I am SOL, as they say. In right. fact, and you, you want to look at it from a uh, perspective of people that might want to be able to provide this medicine to people. I mean, the, 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 the entry, the bar for entry is set very, very high. I mean, they require a million dollar uh, 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 surety bond. Uh, they require five million dollars. I'm sorry, a million dollars in escrow and a five million dollar surety bond. This is not this is not designed for anybody to be able to provide medicine for anybody. This law is designed to line the pockets of, of the people that uh, uh, that are in line to to sell this. And the price is going to be high for it. I imagine it's going to be very high. I mean, it's going to be a very small market. Who's who's going to want to choose between the driver's license and a uh, fifty dollar sack, you know, that they can get on the street? I keep falling back to Thomas Edison. Tom is, is sitting down again with the mayor of Hoboken, the mayor of Newark. Look, guys, I might burn the town down. <laughs> I, might, I might blow some stuff up. Really sorry if I do, but I'm a scientist, and I don't know how all this is going to work until I try it. So I might do all of these things. And do you know how many substances... Tom Edison had to try before he found a substance that worked as a filament in a light bulb. Ten thousand substances. Well, I didn't know that. I did not know Ten thousand. What does that mean to a medical patient with a plant that has oh eighty to one hundred and five cannabinoids? And for you mathematicians out there, if you look at the combinations of any one. Any two, any five. You look at every combination. I believe when I Googled it, I came up with the number 10 to the 87th power. 10 with 87 zeros for different combinations. That screams for American inventiveness. That screams for an effort to learn what might help a Charlotte's Web baby or what might help a back surgery um, patient. And the limits that the government is, in addition to regulating, it is so important that we pay attention and don't create regulations that stymie creativity. We're good at creativity. We, we yeah, don't yeah. want... We don't want to limit that. Let me ask you this. When you were, you were in uniform for a while, correct? Right. Okay. Correct. Did any drunk ever take a swing at you? Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, down, I live in Georgia, so usually it's the, you know, the, the redneck two-point stance and they bull rush you. But, yeah, Absolutely. I got scolded for using that term once in front of yeah, a crowd of three or four thousand so. people. <laughs> but I don't live there, so I don't have that <laughs> that that room to move. Uh, where were we going with that? It was your question. 
Well, I'll tell you where we need to be going with that is to a nice wrap up. We are down to the last few minutes of the big broadcast. We got about six left to wrap her up and say good night. So you can start putting a shout out to organizations, bills you want people to pay attention to, events that are coming up here at Time for Hemp. All right, we'll start with our guest first. I hate silence. I mean, I'm, I, there's no point in being quiet when I talk. Steven. Yeah. Spotlight, URLs and organizations. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm what, sir? We want Who would to you like spotlight. to give a shout out to, a plug for, a pat on the back? Oh, uh, oh, uh, hmm. So, let's see here. I don't know. Uh, you can, you know, I can mention Southern Cannabis again. I mean, that's where uh, people seem to like to go and uh, follow my stuff. So, well, um, Southern yeah. Cannabis sounds like a nice place to hang out. I know there's a lot of uh, yeah. Southern Southern uh, comfort and a Southern hospitality that you're all famous yeah. for. So. Well, it's, I mean, you know, it's about keeping people informed. I've, I found that people really like the regional aspect. In fact, I've set up some. Uh, domains for other regions where, uh, you know, I plan to find some editors that are uh, active in those regions and kind of turn it over to them. And so we can kind of start to build a network of cannabis-related, you know, news sites that, you know, directs each each region, you know. I mean, it uh, uh, focuses on each region. And then we can syndicate that news across each site. Groovy. And your honor. Right? Your honor. I want to jump in, remind people that it's leap.cc. They need your money to keep this effort going. And time for hemp. We are here because of you. Without you, there is no us. And let me point one other thing out. Let me give a plug for vaporizing. We talked about the 100 plus chemicals added by combustion. The rest of that sentence is when one vaporizes, the temperature does not reach combustion temperature. And instead of burning something, it's much more akin to toasting it. Instead of ashes at the end, you end up with what looks like ground up pot, except the color is drained from it. So we are able to get the cannabinoids that we do want without the extra burden of the hundred or so chemicals that are not part of the choice we're making when we choose to imbibe marijuana products. And I want to remind people that we are a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week broadcasting network. Make it a point to get a Google app to download into your smart devices. We've also got Tumblr apps and SoundCloud apps and uh, we are expanding everywhere we know how to on the Internet, so please make it a point to share us with your friends. Also, let our hosts know how much you appreciate their work. Send them emails, and uh, let our sponsors know that you heard about them here on the big broadcast. And remember, the next time you hear me, you'll know that it's time for hemp. All right. Not a communist, so when they came for the communist, I held my tongue, minded my own business like a good neighbor. I trusted the justice was done. I didn't ask. 
What was their crime? It was their sadness. Wasn't mine. I didn't care where they were sent. By my silence, I gave my consent. By my silence, I gave my consent. I am not Jewish, so when they came for the Jews, I had nothing to say. Branded with stars like cattle in boxcars, and then taken away. I didn't ask what was their crime. It was their sadness. Was it mine? I didn't. Where they were sent, by my silence I gave my consent. By my silence I gave my consent. I didn't care when they came for the unionists, came for the socialists, took the powerless. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not an immigrant. Faithfully ignorant. I didn't care what was their crime. Till their sorrow turned into mine. Their sorrow turned into mine. I was okay, 'cause I was a citizen, and I was free. I didn't care. Now there's nobody there, no one to speak out for me. At the time I'd leave, it never happened to me. I didn't. Give my.